Hi, right, this is day six of the poems, and today I'm going to read from the collected poems of Hall Blackburn. And the name of the poem is Working Late on a Hot Night. It says quarter to six on one watch and 3 a.m. on another, and the spots on the floor of my living room are from where the ice cubes melted. But not everything is that predictable, and the baskets of bread at an Italian bakery's cellar round the corner were moons or unloved loves, things we never eat, but still hot. I went down and touched one. And that's from uh, 1961. And uh, since that's the poem, I think you're probably wondering why the video is longer. And uh, I just decided to talk a little bit about other stuff because um, I've been keeping up with this uh, litmus thing, litmus test or whatever. And uh, the most interesting one was the uh, like the story, uh, like tell your story with literature. What what's your what's your life of literature and um, yeah, I thought that was interesting because I watched a couple of them and I noticed that people, um, well, I, I didn't watch many of them, but uh, a couple that I watched, I thought it was interesting, the difference between uh, what their inclination was and what mine is, because um, I really don't have much of a, mem a good memory for what I read when I was young, like before 16 years old. I mean, I remember reading a decent amount in class. Like we would have these these charts where if you, if you read a book, you uh, put it like a sticker up or something. And then like somehow you got like a hall pass if you got the most or something like that. And I remember doing that. I remember reading like Magic Treehouse books around that time period. That was like third grade. And then... Um, a little later, I remember reading the Harry Potter books up to book five, I think. And I had a friend who who was reading those with me. But uh, really after that, I kind of stopped reading mostly. I started getting into uh, video games and more or less stopped reading. Um, that was for like two or three years from like... I don't know. It was uh, it was like middle school, basically. Yeah, about middle school. And then that's when I started getting slowly back into stuff, like around eighth grade. I, I started reading like post-apocalyptic stuff, like Earth Abides, uh, The Road, Alas, Babylon. I really loved those books at that time period. And then then uh, gradually, I, I think like two years later or so, I had gotten into John Keats. Um, I had just been randomly like walking through the library. I used to eat lunch in the library um, partially because uh, I didn't really have a good way to like engage with people at lunch. I, I moved halfway through a year in high school. So that left me as like the kid that doesn't talk, you know, that's how I became known, I, I suppose. And, um, and I, I realized that. So then I felt I couldn't get past that. So I just, you know, sat in the library or like sat in the hallway that nobody went in. And that's really when I started to get into literature and like all the music I like now. So in one way, it was an unpleasant experience. But I have to say that 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 unpleasant experience probably set me up for life of enjoyment now uh, because you know, so many good books to read. I'll never run out and then music too. But yeah, like really that's when my memory of reading comes around. Like when I was about 17, 18, that's when I really start remembering like what I was reading, what I was thinking when I was reading, how it made me feel, how I, how I perceive myself through others, like in relation to my reading. I never really thought of it when I was younger. And I think that's really interesting, like really weird, but um, yeah, when I was like 17 and 18, I didn't, 
I know reading is generally considered like an intellectual activity, like um, smart people read. Uh, you know, if you're a college graduate, you're more likely to read than if you're not, that sort of thing. But I have to say personally, and I don't know if this is some sort of self-deception, but I never really felt that way about myself. I mean, I've had people sometimes tell me like, oh, wow, you read? Uh, like, oh, I wish I read more, or something like that. You know, as if it's a, a good trait. But I have to say that I don't read because it's a good trait or because I think it will, like, benefit me so much in life. You know, like maybe someone would invest in the stock market or, <laughs> I don't know, like, take self-help classes or something. I have no idea. Or go to therapy. Well, but... Um, yeah, I, I suppose I had like a less less analytical reason to read. I, I did it because it was there, and then I just enjoyed it so much. But I think the main reason that I read is that, uh, and, I, and I found this out, and I'm not even sure if it's completely true, but I think it's almost a substitute for friends, you know, put in the most blunt language possible. Because, um, and I think this also happens with, like, by, by, like, uh, like, the tangentiality or however you'd say it, by connection, a lot of readers think that writers are their friends. I heard of this first in, uh, in a, a documentary about J.D. Salinger, how some people would come to his house, and he hated that. He was like, you don't know me, I don't know you, you just read my books. And uh, I also noticed it in Michael Silverblatt's interview, or not an interview, but it's more like a talk he did, where he said that, uh, yeah, and John Barth, I saw him as my friend. He didn't know it yet, but he wasn't going to escape my love. And I ha I've had similar feelings before, like, uh, since I was young, like when I was really little, I would always carry around like toy cars or stuff like that, or like rocks just always with me, like in my pocket or whatever. And now it's become books. I always carry books around with me, usually in a bag or in my car or something. I don't, I don't walk around displaying infinite jest or something, <laughs> but um, yeah, I was sitting in my car and I had a book in like the passenger seat just as like transportation, I suppose, transporting the book. <laughs> and uh, you know, in a way they're like comfort objects, but I just looked over at it and I was like, you know, I have, I have books in the passenger seat more than I do friends, you know, by far, you know, like by a huge margin. It's like, these books are my friends in like the, almost the most basic sense possible. And, uh, you know, I can realize how that would be weird to say. Like, I imagine if I walked up to, you know, a hundred people and I told them that, maybe half of them would think I was crazy. But, or maybe more probably, probably more. But, I don't think it's that crazy. Because uh, I think that's part, part of what literature is, or maybe even the biggest part of what literature is, since, like, uh, books came around, is that, you know, you're basically talking to your friends who uh, who don't know you're their friend, you know. You publish a book and you, you throw it out in the world and people read it who you'll never meet and you would have never met in your life ever. But you get to, you know, more or less communicate with them and uh, that's even more the case with books that are like old, you know, 100 years old. You would have really never been able to communicate with them and if you have like an uncommon personality maybe, or maybe you like a certain type of people that's not very common, you know, if you, if you include all the people in the past, that sort of person is much more uh, likely to appear. So I think, I think for people who are unusual or have a certain type of personality, I think books can be really good because, uh, you know, if you take like a cross section of people alive now, you know, 7 billion people, it may be very hard to find those people that, you know, you would get along with or you'd fit in with. But if you look through literature, you can, you can like, it's almost like self-selection where 
the people like you are the type that wrote books. Maybe because they at their time had a hard time finding people to be friends with. So then they had to write books and read books by other people who in the past had trouble finding friends. At least that's an experience that I found quite a lot with myself. Like a lot of my favorite authors, it seems they struggled very hard with loneliness or um, maybe they struggled in the beginning and then got used to it. Something like that. And uh, I have no idea why it is. I can guess, but it's very unusual. And I think probably a lot of people in this like uh, booktube space probably have the same thing because... I don't know, I just get the feeling that if you had like a healthy friend group of literature people to talk to, you would uh, probably be less inclined to spend the time to, you know, make videos, edit them, put them out there, uh, you know, talk to people who you know, have unusual schedules or, you know, whatever, but I don't know. Sorry, this is going to be like an extremely <laughs> like unplanned video. So, uh, yeah. <clears throat> but yeah, I've always I've always had the feeling that uh, if I had a lot of friends, I wouldn't read nearly as much as I do. Now, I've never had an opportunity to test that. <clears throat> but I think it's correct. I'm not sure though. I think it would depend on the type of friends. Because I can easily imagine if I had friends that, you know, were serious, like readers or got really obsessed with literature like like I do, uh, I can imagine that, you know, I would, I would feel this, you know, communal fervor and just, you know, it would probably spiral out of control and I'd burn myself out maybe. Maybe, maybe in that way I would read less, but I, I, don't, I don't know. It'd be hard to say, but I can imagine myself if I got more social friends that just like to sit around and talk. I would definitely read less. And I feel like that's another thing with uh, like just thinking about things in general because uh, it's very enjoyable just to talk to people and talk about nothing for hours, absolutely nothing, and gain, gain nothing from the conversation other than just uh, enjoyment of you know, being with another person. But you can't really do that with yourself, or at least I can't do that yet. I imagine maybe some like Zen masters <laughs> To do that, but um, yeah, so I guess when I'm just thinking to myself, I my thoughts one way or another end up being more productive, either like through self knowledge or through just like running through hypotheses and stuff. But uh, yeah, so in that way, I've always felt like I've always got the impression that. Um, People who have less friends have a higher chance of being more knowledgeable or you could say more intelligent, but that's not because they are. It's just because they have, they're uh, either forced or they choose to be alone more. And then it seems to me, you know, certain scenarios, uh, those people who are forced to be alone have more productive thoughts than, uh, you know, you would maybe just talking to a friend and laughing for three hours, which is productive in a different way, but you know, in the way that makes you seem intelligent or something. I don't think that would uh, induce that. But, yeah, I've always, I've always struggled with that feeling because, you know, sometimes I used to hide the fact that I read from people. And I used to not talk about literature because uh, I would hide the fact that I read because I didn't want to give off the impression that I was some, you know, I was some fancy dude who thought he was better than everyone or, you know, like... Uh, <clears throat> I'm some like intellectual or something like that because uh, really all the people I like in my life aren't like that. I, I wouldn't want to be seen like that uh, necessarily. Uh, so I would kind of hide the fact. And then also I would never talk about books because um, I think people get bored almost instantly when you start talking about certain types of books in a certain way. Probably because they have associations with school and just sitting through lectures on like Shakespeare or something. But so I would kind of hide that side of myself with most people, and that, that was unpleasant. So I've just almost given up in that way of like trying to please other people. And I tell people I read, uh, like in Black Friday, people are like, "Oh, what'd you get? Did you get a new TV? New this? New that?" It's like. 
No, I used the $5 off coupon on Amazon for books and I went to my favorite bookstore that had a 20% off sale. <laughs> and then people are, you know, of course that's unusual. So people were surprised, but it, it's just, that's how it is. I, I didn't go out of my way to uh, go to a bookstore so I could tell people I went there on Black Friday to surprise them, obviously. So, I, you know, when I tell people now that I read and, uh, it turns out I read more than, than some people, they're surprised. You know, they, they take it as like, uh, you know, they sometimes will say, oh, I wish I read more. Oh, wow, that's really good. I wish I read more. Reading is, you know, they maybe have a higher opinion of me because of that. But I find that so weird personally. I mean, of course, if someone told me they read, I would love it. And I would ask them what books they read and stuff. But it's not inherently better in any way, <laughs> basically. Because um, you can easily imagine scenarios where people people read literature because they want to be seen as someone who reads literature and they get nothing out of it. So then that sort of person who reads a lot, you know, re reads in air quotes, uh, would be would maybe be worse off than someone who doesn't read and simply thinks about things. And then you can imagine another scenario that may be, um, you know, less stereotypical where someone reads, you know, solely uh, genre fiction or maybe only the Bible or something like that. Um, but they get more insights from their books than someone who only reads, you know, highbrow literature, you know, someone whose favorite book is Finnegan's Wake or something like that. So since both of those scenarios are possible, I don't think it's really easy to tell whether or not someone who reads a lot is uh, better in one way or another. So I've always felt weird. You know, I, I always want to tell people, like, it doesn't mean anything that I read a lot. It, if, if it means anything, it means I have a hard time making friends, which that's not really, you know, something to be proud of. <laughs> but of course, I don't go into it with them because they're just making a passing comment, you know, being generally friendly. But... Yeah, I've always felt it so weird. And then one of my other main interests is classical music, and that has an even worse connotation to it. Like, I, I asked uh, one guy once, I was like, oh, because he, he was really into music, played the guitar, played, uh, I think played the drums. So I was like, hey, do you ever listen to classical music? And he was like, yeah, I listen to classical music when I, when I want to feel fancy. I get a I get a glass of wine, and I just, you know, lay back with the lights dim <laughs> and put on some music, and I'm like... <laughs> Oh shit. <laughs> you know, I I hate that feeling. I would hate I mean, I don't hate that feeling, but if I listened to classical music to feel fancy, I would immediately stop listening to classical music ever because um I really don't like feeling fancy. That that sort of, you know, uh like <laughs> like a, like a posho or something. <laughs> Because that's not me. Maybe if it was me, I wouldn't mind it, but it's just not me. So, uh, yeah, I was like, you know, I can't even imagine what people think about me when I tell them I like classical music or read. It's just like, it's probably completely wrong. And there's really nothing I can do about that. But, um, yeah, as I gradually got into literature, like going back to the, like the timeline sort of, I, uh, I just would go to the library and that was the best way for me. I would also look at lists on like Wikipedia or just random websites like uh, Modern Library has a hundred, but um, <clears throat> excuse me, hundred best books of the 20th century. And I got a lot of good books from there. Um, there's also like this list of a hundred books by uh, Le Monde, the French website. They did like 100 best books of the 20th century, I think, and uh, that was a good list. Um, just some other ones on uh, Wikipedia, like I would just go into modernism, just make all the links purple, I go into English Renaissance, make all the links purple, that sort of thing. And, or just like the categories where you can look up like modernist poets, you know, and just go through every single one or pick out the ones that have interesting names you know, or maybe people I haven't ever heard of. And I would just kind of go like that, you know, just really random. I wouldn't, because I've always had uh, like one thing about me where, um, so in the beginning when I started getting into literature, I was very uh, weary about Shakespeare because 
gradually I developed this thing where if something's popular, it's, it's probably bad. And that is surprisingly accurate as a heuristic for almost anything. But of course there are outliers and uh, Shakespeare is one of them. Um, I was very suspect of James Joyce. Ulysses was one of the books I started reading in the library when I was like 17, 18. And uh, I definitely didn't understand a lot of the like uh, more um, uh, particular allusions in there, but I did enjoy the language he used because you almost don't need any education to enjoy the language he uses. But um, I was very suspect of people who said they liked him because I was like, well, why do you like him? Do you like him because he's considered the, you know, the greatest author of the 20th century? Or do you like him because you read him and got something personally out of it? You know, and then there's also even further set where you can, you can get something personally out of it because he's considered the best author of the 20th century. So I, I didn't want to be that sort of person. So I was like, well, you know, maybe he's not actually good. I read some of his short stories and I was like, uh, I mean, yeah, they're okay. There's there's stuff I wouldn't do in them, but there's also stuff I never would have imagined to do that's very good. And then uh, I read like two-thirds of Ulysses. I skipped a couple chapters that I thought were boring, like the one where he acts like an encyclopedia. I also skipped the one where he uh, parodies or like at least um, simulates different prose styles throughout English literature. And I was kind of skeptical. I was like, well, you know, uh, a lot of really smart people that I like think he's good, so I'll just like put it on the shelf for a little while and suspend judgment. And another one in that similar category is Picasso, Pablo Picasso. I I looked at his early works and I was like, well, you know, these are amazing. How could someone so technically skilled and, uh, you know, uh, has such a precise emotional intelligence, how could they create something that I see as so, uh, you know, like childish and uh, primitive in a negative sense. But then, of course, I was like, well, you know, his early works are amazing and very intelligent people were friends with him, liked his stuff, so I'll, uh, I'll postpone it. I'll leave it as an unknown. And then gradually throughout time, those three have became, uh, if not favorites, uh, ones I easily enjoy. So I've always been weary of the, um, you know, the, the very popular author in almost every case that I can think of, unless they just struck me instantly with how good they were. Like uh, Proust is one of those examples. He's probably, I don't know, if not the most famous 20th century French author, one of them. But I had no idea how popular he was. And I picked up one of his books in the library, Swan's Way, is that... Uh, every man's library, I think, you know, those red, red covers. And I just read like maybe 15, 20 pages. And I was just struck with how calming it was. And that sensation stuck with me for like four years until I actually read the book. So, um, yeah, I think in that way, I've always been highly suspect of really famous books, but I, I try to give them a fair shot. And also, um, you know, because I'm suspect of high, like really famous books, I also try to find the ones that um, are as good as the famous ones, but simply are less known for, you know, a fault of history or, you know, a f fickle fate for one reason. And um, so in that way, I tend to almost completely disregard how people see books. I mean, of course I know, like, if some people say Ulysses is great, I can't ignore that. I can't, you know, say people don't say that, but I try as little as possible to let it affect my opinion of the book. And then, um, like, after I started getting into the library stuff and all those really big lists, I started going through influences of each author. So if, um, you know, if, what's a good example? Oh, yeah, so, like, so I read, um, I was really into McCarthy, so I read Blood Meridian. <clears throat> and then right after, I read Moby Dick. And then right after that, not right after that, maybe a year later, I read Tristram Shandy. And so in that way, I was kind of like walking backwards. And like uh, after I read Sutri, which became my favorite book, I read that 
um, McCarthy really loved Joyce. So I was like, you know, maybe I'll give, maybe I'll give Ulysses another shot. And, and then <clears throat> it ended up being, I, I acknowledged how good it was. And now I hold it as, you know, what it actually is. One of the best books written in the 20th century. But, um, yeah, I think it can be dangerous to go too far either way to say, well, all these people, it's a conspiracy. You know, they actually don't know what they're reading. They don't understand any of the words, but, you know, they flock to the word genius. But then it's also dangerous to go to the other way where, you know, everyone's a genius. You know, if, <laughs> you know, the racehorse of genius in that passage from uh, Musil, you know, that, that I love so much, that passage. Um, yeah, and then I've always loved poetry for the sound of it. And, uh, I kind of just was more scattered and just in the last year or so I've gotten really deep into modernism and that's been one of the most enjoyable times of my reading. I, I just, something about modernism, I love it so much I ha and I have not figured out what it is. I have no idea what exactly it is, but um, I do love it very much. So um, hopefully this video was interesting if you made it this far, at least you can enjoy the poem if you didn't. Okay, well, um, yeah, thanks for listening, and uh, I really enjoyed all those videos about the uh, history of each individual's reading of literature, but, all right, Death is a Gang Boss.